Okay, well, welcome everybody to the uh, N3C Community Forum, uh, September 26th. And uh, as always, the presentation will be recorded and uh, we uh, like questions, encourage questions. So use the Q&A button uh, or, or the chat, both seem to, to work very well. Uh, and um, so, so uh, the uh, upcoming sessions October 3rd, uh, we're going to be getting uh, pregnancy team updates, um, pregnancy domain team updates, phenotyping and pregnancy, vaccine effectiveness analysis to date in pregnancy. Uh, October 10th, using medical knowledge and machine learning uh, for pediatric uh, hospitalization and severity uh, by Jinming Sun. Uh, 17th of October, upper airway disease in children with Omicron uh, B11529 uh, variant. And October 24th, uh, social determinants of health, uh, extracting that into the OMOP common data model, which is uh, a real challenge. Perhaps extracting can be a challenge, but the accuracy of social determinants of health and electronic medical records is always some, it's always a challenge and it'd be interesting to see how this is going. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we've got still about six and a half million COVID positive cases um, with um, billions, uh, billions of clinical observation lab results, uh, medication records. That next slide. So very much looking forward to this talk. Uh, Rachel Wong has been working uh, in the diabetes uh, COVID area for a couple of years now, actually made uh, tremendous progress and uh, tremendous leadership uh, of, this, of this effort. And um, she's really gathered a great team, uh, part of a great team, but she's had tremendous influence. So um, I'm going to ask you to share your slides and look forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Joel. I am going to share now and just let me know if you can see my slides. Yeah. OK, great. Um, first of all, thanks to the N3C. Thank you so much for letting me uh, giving the opportunity to present my work. I'm going to be talking about two studies that we've done in the diabetes and obesity domain team. And just a little bit about myself. I'm a primary care internist, so I take care of a lot of diabetes. And I'm also recently graduated um, from the clinical informatics fellowship that Dr. Salt started. So um, without further ado, here we go. Uh, so the first study that I'm going to tell you about is about glycemic control and clinical outcomes in US patients with COVID-19. So basically, uh, what is the role of sugars uh, with patients with diabetes? And how does it matter in COVID? So the main issue that uh, we were facing was the diabetes is, we know that diabetes is associated with worse outcomes in COVID, but um, the relationship between glycemic control, so the hemoglobin A1C, um, in COVID outcomes wasn't completely clear. So these COVID outcomes we were most interested in were hospitalization, length of stay, ventilation or ECMO and death. And this was in the US population. Just a little bit of background for you. The prevalence of diabetes is about 13% in the US population. So we're talking about 34 million patients um, or people in the US. And while we know that diabetes is a risk factor for you know, worse COVID outcomes, um, there's some conflicting studies on the relationship between glycemic control and, um, and COVID outcomes. So for example, right here, um, there are two large studies out of the UK um, National Health Service, so large databases of UK patients. And from that data, um, it showed that there was a hazard ratio of 1.3 and uh, 1.95 for patients with diabetes compared to those without, and for those with hemoglobin A1C of less than 7.5 compared to those with higher sugars um, or uncontrolled glycemic control. Um, this other study from, uh, again, the UK databases showed that if you look below, I don't know if you could see my mouse, but there is this U-shaped curve with increasing hemoglobin A1C. So um, from this, it looks like the higher your sugars are chronically, the worse outcomes that you have, um, the, likely, the greater the likelihood of death from COVID. Um, and other studies have shown linear increases. 
However, some of the studies like the Coronado study from France and um, the largest study at the time from the US population is a three hospital New York academic center study. There actually was no association between um, composite scores for A1C and intubation and death. Um, and so we wanted to really kind of tease this out a little bit further with the N3C um, COVID database. The duration of the project was nine months and we used level two data with the data released before um, July 22nd, 2021. Also pertinent to the background, um, a lot of the studies had been done in the UK that were large or Scotland or other sort of um, populations that were not similar to the US population. So if you look at the US census data from 2018, 14% um, of our population is black or African American, uh, and 18% of our population report that they're Hispanic or Latino in ethnicity. Um, from the other studies, there was actually no Hispanic or Latino you know, reported um, patient population, and the black and African American population were, were much less. So they weren't really representative of the US population. Um, also, any, all the U.S. studies at the time were limited to small or single center studies, um, so that one with that three hospital uh, system, they were 75% African American or Black, and so uh, we wanted to do something that was more representative with the general population. So our goal using a large was to use a large U.S. cohort um, to evaluate the association between A1C and several COVID outcomes, namely hospitalization, Invasive, invasive ventilation or ECMO and mortality in acute COVID-19 infection for patients who had type two diabetes. Uh, we also analyzed the subgroup of hospitalized patients um, to, analyze, to look at the relationship between hemoglobin A1C and length of stay. So the inclusion criteria for our study were those age greater than or equal to 18, um, an ICD code of type two diabetes prior to their COVID diagnosis, so with pre-existing diabetes, um, and then a laboratory or ICD code for COVID-19 infection. And they also needed to have a hemoglobin A1C within 365 days prior to, or within seven days after their first COVID infection, um, because we felt that that would like, even seven days in the hemoglobin say, A1C is about three months representation of their, of their glycemic control. And prior studies used um, hemoglobin A1Cs within like about the year prior to COVID diagnosis. Um, for our exclusion criteria, we excluded data partner sites with a less than 1% reported rate of death, hospitalization, vendor ECMO, just in case they're, um, it was just, they weren't being reported uh, with good data quality. Other covariates that we looked at included things like patient demographics, so age, gender, um, sex, uh, or yeah, age, gender, um, we also looked at diabetes medications within 90 days prior to COVID-19 diagnosis and the Charleston co index comorbidities. And again, the outcomes we were looking for were death, um, for which we used either the date of death or for those that were missing dates, we used the date of the last measurement of any medication uh, measurement or condition that was in the, in the record. We also looked at hospitalization, which was characterized as the inpatient visit date with a start date within one week prior to or 30 days from the first date of COVID diagnosis, um, because we wanted to capture those that were related to COVID. Um, and then for ventilation and ECMO and length of stay, those, um, those were in the knowledge store in the N3C. For our analyses, we primarily use logistic regression for categorical variables, um, and I should have written it here, but we use a Cox proportional hazards ratio for mortality. And then we used a linear regression model for continuous variables like length of stay. From our consort diagram, um, we started with uh, patients who had both type two diabetes and COVID diagnoses, and that was about 140,000. And then after exclusion of those without A1C measurements within our time period, pediatric patients and uh, data quality, and those who are missing BMI or gender or sex uh, prior to uh, in the database, we, uh, our final study population was 39,616 patients. This is table one for the study. Um, on the left is the population uh, that we studied and the deaths within the population. So if you see p-values of less than 
uh, 0.05, that's because uh, you know the the, papu the population that died was significantly sicker and older. So you could see over here, 26% um, patients greater than 80. Um, but in general, there were comparable males and females, about 50% of each. Um, our African American and Black population was about 26% of the population. And for Hispanic or Latino, it was 16%. So fairly, or so closer than other studies to the US uh, population based on the census data. Patients were generally um, overweight to obese, um, most of them falling within this range over here, um, 25 to 35. And we have the rates of myocardial infarction, stroke, dementia, all the different comorbidities um, for the both population and those that died. And then some of the medications that we used, uh, that we measured were use of metformin and other oral hypoglycemics as well as insulin. And you could see from our study population, about 49% of our patients were hospitalized um, in this data set and 7% of them required ventilation or ECMO. So for the results, um, this was uh, the Cox proportional hazard uh, Cox proportional hazard ratio, uh, fully adjusted for all of the comorbidities and um, demographics that you see on the left. Uh, so this was for hazard for death within 30 days of COVID-19 diagnosis. So the main findings I put in uh, this blue box. So it's for hemoglobin A1C under seven, six to seven, seven to eight eight to nine and nine to 10 and over 10, you could see that there is a linearly increasing risk of death with each HbA1c level up to eight. Um, and from eight onward, it sort of remains the same um, in this hazard ratio. So that was an interesting finding because it was in contrast to that U-shaped curve where risk continued to increase with increasing hemoglobin A1c level. These are the adjusted odds ratios using a logistic, uh, re logistic regression model for hospitalization on the left and ventilation or ECMO on the right within 30 days of COVID-19 diagnosis. So again, you can see over here on the right that um, ventilation, there's an increased risk of death and that kind of plateaus at a hemoglobin A1C of nine and above. Um, however, with hospitalization, the risk of hospitalization increases um, with increasing HbA1c. For the linear regression, um, looking at length of stay in the relationship with hemoglobin A1c, we really didn't see as much of a difference. So if you look um, where my mouse is pointing, uh, the only place where there was a slightly significant increase was a hemoglobin A1C over 10, and that just barely squeaked by with a p-value of 0 0.049. So our findings and interpretation of the data, um, well, this was the largest multicenter US cohort study looking at hemoglobin A1C and COVID outcomes. Um, and our main conclusions were that while worse glycemic control increases the risk for hospitalization, the effect plateaus at certain levels of glycemia for more severe outcomes, namely ventilation or ECMO at a hemoglobin A1C greater than nine and death at a hemoglobin A1C greater than, than eight in contrast to prior findings. Um, also in our more diverse patient population, there was a statistically significant increase in death with Hispanic or Latino ethnicity, um, but we did not see that with black or African-American race. And we also saw a decreased odds for poor outcomes with most of the non-insulin oral agents um, or yeah, non-insulin hypoglycemic agents, which was in line with previously reported protective effects of medications like metformin. Um, we did see a slight increased risk with insulin though. But uh, let's see. Um, some of the challenges that we faced with the study was that this cohort might be biased towards more patients who are severely ill. So if you noticed our 48, 49% hospitalization rate, um, I think this is reflective of the fact that many of the data contributors to the N3C are primarily academic medical centers. So this is not necessarily generalizable towards everybody, but it is a, still a good um, Sample, like it, it is a good sampling that is representative of the US population um, compared to other studies. We also had the inability to obtain information on the duration of diabetes um, because the EHR data 
uh, may not have, you know, longitudinal data on every patient. Uh, we, and a lot of that is embedded in the free text on how long they've had diabetes. Uh, we weren't really able to get to that. And it can have a big difference in terms of um, outcomes in diabetes. We also had difficulty ascertaining the type of diabetes, type one versus type two. Um, and we didn't have many patients with type one. So we just stuck primarily to type two diagnoses. And there was also the issue there, we had some data missingness. So you saw a third of our patients um, were excluded due to lack of BMI and some um, lower percentages didn't have any race or ethnicity data. So we're, we're kind of currently working on um, the next steps in this using multiple imputation to, to sort of also look at these findings and whether it makes a difference. In terms of the impact on the field, um, I think this is interesting because the findings suggest that uh, there are thresholds of glycemic control that may be correlated with different outcomes. So while patients may be hospitalized who have higher levels and higher and higher levels of A1C, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they will have more severe hospital outcomes like ventilation, ECMO, or death. Um, and this is interesting because in the diabetes literature, there is this idea of thresholds and what thresholds of glycemic control are most important um, for different outcomes, including microvascular, macrovascular income, um, outcomes. So this is suggestive that there's also thresholds um, with, uh, with acute COVID outcomes. So um, our future studies at this point, we were, this is sort of midway through my project, and uh, we had also made this goal to, as the pandemic uh, was going on, to look at the effect of COVID-19 infection on longer term outcomes in diabetes. So sort of the converse of the first project. So um, take you to the next project. So this was the effect of COVID-19 infection and infection severity on longer term glycemic control and weight in persons with type two diabetes. So basically, what is COVID doing to our patients with diabetes? So the issue that we're talking about here is um, diabetes and care related to diabetes and obesity make up a huge, um, huge burden of healthcare within the US. Um, and so it's important to evaluate whether there are longer term sequelae of COVID infection um, on glycemic control and weight. The background on this, um, there are multiple studies that suggest that there's a diabetogenic effect of COVID-19. Um, some of them show increased incidence of diabetes anywhere from like a pool prevalence of 14 to almost 20%. So that's actually a large, um, given the amount of patients who have COVID and the amount of burden that diabetes has on the healthcare system and our patients, that could potentially be a lot of patients. Some of the proposed pathophysiology for these diabetogenic effects are that SARS-CoV-2 um, virus is directly impacting or invading the pancreatic islet cells, um, causing dysfunction. There's also hypotheses that there's inflammation that causes acute hyperglycemia, the cascade of cytokines, and also insulin resistance. And in terms of studies that have looked at the longer term glycemic outcomes, um, there was only one published study that had a subgroup of 49 patients with diabetes. And that showed that there was no change in the hemoglobin A1C at a median follow-up of 215 days. With regard to weights, um, there had been several studies showing unintended weight loss in a high percentage of patients with COVID-19 during their hospitalization or at follow-up. Uh, with first factors for malnutrition being, being male, gender, um, ICU stay, or a longer duration of disease. But some of the limitations in these studies are their follow-up period was pretty much from three weeks to three months after COVID infection. So it was um, in the acute or subacute sort of follow-up period. And they were small studies without any comparison groups. So there were no controls um, of patients without COVID. The duration of the project uh, was 12 months for this one. And we also used level two data with the release date of July 22nd, 2021. So our main goal here was to evaluate the effects of COVID-19 infection and the severity of that infection on longer term glycemic control and weight. And we wanted to use match controls for this study. Our inclusion were patients who were adults um, with 
a diagnosis of diabetes prior to their index date of COVID infection. And they also needed to have at least one hemoglobin A1C within one year to seven days of their infection. And they also needed to have an A1C at least 90 days after their index date because we wanted to make sure that these patients had enough follow-up where we could actually look at these outcomes. We also wanted to make sure that they had at least one outpatient medication prescribed prior to the index date so that we had um, prescri so that we knew that we had prescription data for those patients and we could say whether they were on diabetes medications um, or not on any medications prior to the index date. For our control group, we had a control of patients who had negative SARS-CoV PCR tests and no diagnosis by either um, test or or uh, code within our in, within our database. And for their index date, we also used that um, negative COVID PCR date as the index date of infection. So we wanted to get a comparable group um, where they would also have health seeking behaviors and um, that overlapped in the time period of COVID. For our covariates, um, they were primarily the same as um, in the first study, demographics, Carlson index comorbidities, diabetes medications within 90 days prior to COVID diagnosis, but we also added the pre-index average hemoglobin A1C and weight. So we defined this as the average of all the hemoglobin, all the measurement levels within one year before or up to seven days after the index date. So if a patient had three or four hemoglobin A1Cs, those would be a mean value, um, or if they only had one, it would be one value. For the primary outcome, we were looking at the post-index average hemoglobin A1C and weight, which we defined as the average of all of the A1C levels or the weights from 90 days after infection to 455 five days after the index date, um, because we wanted to give a three month period between their acute infection and the time that we were measuring hemoglobin A1Cs so that we were looking at longer term um, hemoglobin A1C and not just infection related A1C. So one year prior to, one year prior to the index date versus um, one year after the index date plus 90 days uh, with a 90 day wait time in between. Um, in a secondary analysis, we wanted to look at the effect of hospitalization and invasive mechanical ventilation on post-index average hemoglobin A1C and weight also. So we did this among um, the subgroup, uh, a subgroup of patients. Or I'm sorry, we did this as a secondary analysis, not, not with a subgroup. For statistical analyses, we um, used propensity score matching with uh, an R package called MatchIt to make sure that our study population and controls were similar. And then we used multivariable linear regression for continuous variables. So those were post-index average hemoglobin A1C and weight. Um, in addition to that, uh, to make sure that our, we were not biased with any unmeasured confounding, we did sensitivity testing uh, using the equivalence test to measure those effects. And then also to make sure that to account um, for, the, for the differential censoring that might have happened um, due to death or loss to follow up, we used inverse probability weighting of uh, inverse probability of sensory weighting to account for this. So basically, if patients were um, more likely to be lost to follow up or death, they were weighted more heavily in the analyses so that we could try to incorporate um, you know, something that, uh, to incorporate those who might've been lost to follow up. Our baseline cohort characteristics and their match controls are reported in, um, in these graphs or this table. And you'll see that we had slight female predominance um, in both uh, the control and the study group. Um, we reported the standardized mean differences, and they were all less than 0.1. Um, so they were all very similar in terms of uh, study and control populations. And again, you can see from that, uh, from our population, we had about 21% Black African American, and then 25 to 26% Hispanic or Latino. And the rest is just reported um, here. So let's get to the results. Um, so in terms of our COVID-19 population, 
the rate of hospitalization, oh, our COVID-19 and diabetic population, um, the hospitalization rate was 38% and the rate of invasive ventilation or ECMO was 3.2% with a mean length of stay of 6.6 .6 days um, for their COVID infection. In terms of the number of measurements of um, A1Cs prior to the uh, COVID, prior to the index date, there was a mean, there was an average of two um, measurements pre-index date and one point, about 1 1.5, 1 1.6 measurements after the index date. Um, and there were about 84 to 90 or 93 days between measurement, measurements um, for COVID-19 patients and controls. And for weight measurements, we had about 12 to 13 measurements beforehand, and then um, eight measurements uh, after the index date with an average of 17 to 20 days between measurements. Um, on the whole, pre and post index average A1Cs were 7.5 and 7.3%, and the average uh, pre and post index weights were 92 kilograms and 90.7 kilograms. And for our primary analysis, um, we found that there was actually no statistically significant difference in the post-index average hemoglobin A1C between COVID patients and matched controls. So you'll see here the coefficient is 0 0.008, which is really, there's no difference in the A1C and the p-value is non-significant. And actually we found the same thing for weight, that there was no significant difference. Um, it was negative 0.65 kilograms. Um, and again, non-significant p-value. So that was for the population level um, A1C and weight differences. Um, in terms of the distribution of percent change in A1C and weight, we wanted to make sure that there weren't just patients at the tail ends that were um, you know, having these wide differences. Um, so we, this is a plot of the distribution of hemoglobin A1Cs uh, change, the change in hemoglobin A1C with the controls superimposed over the COVID-19 patients. And what you see here is that they really look identical. They're, they're kind of lining up very nicely, um, meaning that at the population level, uh, in the middle and at the extremes, it's the same distribution of hemoglobin A1Cs. And then the same thing for weight. This is the change in average weight per kilogram. So most patients losing or gaining, um, uh, you know, very little, and then a few at the extremes. But again, the distribution looks the same. These are um, linear regression analyses showing the adjusted coefficients for post-index hemoglobin A1C in both positive patient, COVID positive patients on the left and controls on the left, uh, controls on the right. So this was to look at the uh, impact of hospitalization or mechanical ventilation on um, change in hemoglobin A1C. So if you look here at the top, hospitalization did not significantly impact um, hemoglobin, change in hemoglobin A1C, um, although there was, for mechanical ventilation, a negative 0.4% um, change in A1C. For the control patients, there's a similar trend where it looks like um, there may be a decreased hemoglobin A1C after mechanical ventilation, but it was not statistically significant. And this is the same plot, but for the post-index weight. Um, so looking at hospitalization, there was a um, negative, like a 0.9 kilogram loss um, in those who were hospitalized that had COVID and a four kilogram um, weight loss in those who required mechanical ventilation. And we actually see a similar pattern in those who were just uh, the control patients who were hospitalized for other reasons. They also lost weight with more weight loss among those who required mechanical ventilation. So our main findings and interpretation of this data uh, was that there was little difference in the post-index average A1C or weight for patients who had COVID-19 compared to a matched control group. Uh, we ran sensitivity analyses for, uh, to detect um, confounding that would account for more than 0.5% change in A1C and a 2.5 kilogram change in weight loss. And um, our findings appeared to be insensitive to these measured confounders. So they were pretty robust findings. So main conclusion was that for patients with pre-existing type two diabetes, 
Glycemic control and weight change in the year after illness was not really clinically different from those without COVID-19 infection. Um, on the whole, these results are pretty reassuring. So I was, I was happy as a primary care physician because our concern was that after COVID-19 and all of these hyperglycemic effects and um, you know, high sugars that we were seeing in the hospital, that these would be persistent. But from this data, um, it looks like on average, those levels do not seem to be changing um, much after acute infection. For patients uh, in, the, in the secondary analyses, for patients who required mechanical ventilation, they did have a significant decrease um, in the hemoglobin A1C of 0.4%, which we didn't really see um, as pronounced in the control group. So in terms of this, it, the mechanism is unclear, but um, it would it's possible that symptoms after critical care like dysphagia, altered tastes, anorexia, just being critically ill and on a mechanical ventilation um, may account for you know, changes in diet and um, lifestyle that may decrease the hemoglobin A1C. Um, and we want to also remember that overall hemoglobin A1C may not necessarily be indicative of improved glycemic control, like in a positive way, but this could represent more periods of hypoglycemia, or it could be that patients are more ill and they just, you know, their A1C went down, but they're not necessarily healthier. So I, I kind of take this finding with a grain of salt um, in terms of saying improved hemoglobin A1C. Uh, we also see that for the average weight loss in those requiring vent or ECMO was four kilograms um, for COVID-19 patients, and it was a little bit less in controls. Um, and I was thinking about that, and I, for a potential mechanism, um, when we looked at the length of stay for those COVID patients who required mechanical ventilation, they were on ventilators for a lot longer. The mean was about four, almost 45 days compared to controls who required um, ventilation for other reasons. Their mean stay was about eight, uh, their mean days were about 18 for length of stay. So um, COVID patients were just hospitalized for a lot longer. And um, you know, anecdotally, they were, yeah, there was a lot longer periods of mechanical ventilation. So impact on the field, um, our findings suggest that COVID-19 is not associated with significant longer term change in glycemic control or weight. So from a primary care standpoint, I, this is very reassuring because the burden of disease is great. The amount of care needed for diabetes is, um, is also very, is, is really high in the US and the comorbidities and complications that can come with uncontrolled diabetes um, are also can severely impact cost and uh, just health in the US population. So I, I found this to be somewhat reassuring. Um, our next goals are for future studies um, are to look at um, the incidence of new diabetes with after COVID-19 infection, because like I said, there were some studies that suggested there was going to be an increased, um, there's increased incidence of COVID. So we were going to study, or we are going to study the effect of COVID-19 infection and infection-related factors on new diabetes or those with severe presentation at diagnosis. Um, because, you know, I don't know about everybody else, but on the floors, I was seeing higher rates of DKA and um, severe presentations, hyperosmolar coma um, being one of them. So we were going to look at the effect of variants, inflammatory biomarkers, and corticosteroid use on new diabetes. Um, the second part of the study is um, whether there are patient-related factors that are associated with increased incident diabetes. So things like social determinants of health, um, comorbidities, BMI, and uh, vaccination status. And then lastly, for patients with incident diabetes, um, we wanted to study whether they'll have worse long-term outcomes. So there's some data that um, shows that patients uh, go into remission or like this study that, you know, things don't get too much worse, like in terms of their glycemic control from COVID. So it would be interesting to look at rates of remission and, um, you know, need for, need for medication and A1Cs compared to those without COVID-19 infection who have incident diabetes. I would like to give special thanks to the Diabetes, Obesity, and Domain team and the Stony Brook BMI Clinical Informatics Fellowship, where um, they really were very, very supportive in this work, and to all the collaborators um, at all these institutions who were 
just wonderful mentors and collaborators um, in this work because this was not done in a vacuum. Fantastic. Well, that's great talk. Um, questions? I don't see any in the uh, let's see Q and A um, chat. So, so one of the things that was really striking to me about the study was I, I I think a lot of people, certainly including myself, um, thought that since you know COVID is bad and diabetes is bad, then if you have COVID, then your more like your diabetes is going to get worse. And and uh, one of the things that was really actually impressive was that you know, studies that don't find an effect can be, I think, harder to publish. Uh, and it was impressive that uh, it was published in a good place. And you know, could you speak to the to the to the to the the, the issue of, in some sense, demonstrating that something uh, statistically appeared not to happen? You can't say it didn't happen, but but that it was it was not just a we looked for it and we didn't find it, but we looked at enough people that we think it really didn't exist, uh, or do you think it really doesn't exist? I think that is interesting because we weren't expect. I mean, our hypothesis is that, you know, the sugars, the glycemic control would be worse. So we were sort of surprised by these findings. And we spent a lot of time thinking about the seven, uh, the sensitivity analyses to say, you know, how robust is this effect? So, um, you know, we, yeah, we were, I think, hopefully thoughtful about um, making sure that these negative findings were in fact true. And I think from a publishers, publishability standpoint, um, I like that they were negative findings. I mean, for me, it's very reassuring as a clinician because I don't want to see this huge surge of diabetes, you know, worsening glycemic outcomes. And uh, I think it's just important to, as important to know that as to know if, if you know, they were positive. So... They were happy. Oh, absolutely no. No, I I think I think that that it 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 makes me think that that there probably if there were enough funding maybe there should be enough funding that you should have sort of red teams and blue teams uh, with sort of biases in either direction for epidemiological questions because uh, you no know, the number the number of of, of times. Uh, research groups have gone back and forth, for instance, on coffee. Uh, since I was in medical school, uh, the, there there was a, uh, a biostat sort of mini course for the first year medical students. And one of the papers that we covered was a paper about epidemiology of coffee and you know, heart attacks and things like that. And, uh, and this was an example of a bad paper, bad statistical methods. But good or bad statistical methods, a lot of these things go back and forth. Think about margarine, think, of, think about cholesterol. Uh, and uh, and you know, negative results are, 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 are really important, I think, in these things. So- uh, Yeah, and I think hopefully we answered the question that was looming large, you know? Yeah, whether the results were negative or positive. No, it's great. And, and, and to your point, it doesn't really speak to new incident diabetes because you're looking at people who already had hemoglobin A1Cs that were abnormal. So it doesn't really, it, it might be the, the intuition um, that, it, that, that, that COVID in some cases, you know, I mean, it, you, you, you'd expect it it, it, it. it might have a long-term effect since it seems to have a short-term effect, but it might just be incident diabetes. I, it definitely makes a lot of sense to look at that next. Yes, and we're um, yeah we're able to use a lot of the work that leverage a lot of what we've done in these sort of settings to to use for that work. So we're very excited about it, and the results are you know I'll hopefully be able to give you an update <laughs> next year. Great. Oh, a question from Jihad Obey. Hey, I haven't talked to you in 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 years. Uh, good good to. Good to meet you virtually. So what variables uh, uh, were used for propensity matching? Oh, okay, so the variables that we use, um, they're actually all, we matched on all of the variables that you see in those tables. So um, 
except for hospitalization and mechanical ventilation, because those could be impacted by COVID. So we didn't want to match based on um, the, you know, uh, COVID-19. Um, so we match based on the, you know, gender, age um, by, um, by categories like 40 to 49, 50 to 59, um, race, ethnicity, BMI, Charleston comorbidities, and medications. Um, and we, you know, there was there was a very good match um, in terms in along the entire distribution of the COVID and the control patients. Right. Use, yeah, general linearized model, uh, GLM, for the propensity for matching. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks for a great talk. And uh, if there are no other. There's a one question. Um... Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. That was that got answered. Sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for a great talk, and we'll see see you folks. Oh wait, we've got a. Uh, do we have something else coming? No. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much, everybody. Excuse me. Oh, I was just saying thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Have a good week. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.